guys? Welcome back to the Foolishness Podcast. This is Brian Sumner walking us through the Gospel of John. I have a couple of interviews coming up for the next few episodes. We'll take a bit of a break between chapter one, chapter two, but I hope you've been encouraged. And if you know me, as I believe, as with most believers, the most important thing is the Word of God. And so while there's all these great podcasts out there or great books, the most important thing is do we know and understand God's word and are we living by it? And so as we get into John today, we finished off last week with verse 17, how the law was given through Moses, how the Old Testament brings us the law and the prophets, but in Jesus Christ, how we now have grace and truth through Christ. Yes, that was there in the Old Testament, but we see it now in the person of Jesus. And this was all about how he fulfilled this. And so most people generally, when they finish John's prologue from John 1.1 to 1.18, they end with verse 18. But we finished last week looking at verse 17. Because this week, I wanted to take a bit more time unpacking 18, and we'll finish up chapter 1 of John today. But there's just some amazing things here. First of all, is that we see in John 1 and 18, we've heard this prologue, we've heard from the Apostle John. And there's this saying, no one can see God and live. And the issue is that many Muslims, many Jehovah Witnesses, many Unitarians who oppose the doctrine of the Trinity, they use this idea that no one can see God and live to say, well, Jesus is not God. Why? Because Jesus walked among men. Jesus walked the earth 2,000 years ago for 33 years. So if no one can see God and live, yet many people seen Jesus, how can Jesus be God? And verse 18 reads, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And generally these challenges to this idea are thrown out at people while preaching on the street or even in the midst of debates. And so we have to ask ourselves, if this was recorded 2,000 years ago, how did the early church deal with this? How have believers, theologians, well-educated scholars handled this idea since then? Well, in context, This verse is just part of John's primary narrative. Because since verse 1, who has John been setting up? Jesus. He's been setting up Jesus, whom John has named as the Word, who is the Word personified. And so now he is telling us that this Jesus, who is the Word and was God, has been clearly seen. So while verse 18 is the end of John's prologue, how did he start it? He writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And notice what John did. He presented the Word to define it as though it was separate from God. John uses God as a personal preference because in the Greek it's articular. Because it's accompanied by the, and so it's defining God. But secondly, God is presented in John's first sentence as separate from the Word, meaning John wants us to hear about the Word first and then about God. He wants us to hold two trains of thought when starting, two separate ideas. Are you following me? The Word and God. And John is launching his gospel this way, remember now, and he hasn't told us yet who is the Word or even who God is, but he just gives us these two trains of thought, the Word and God. And what does he do next? Next, he moves on to say, and the Word was God. And this isn't a personal preference now. This is a qualitative reference. What do I mean? John is saying that there's the Word and there's God. Then he states clearly that the Word was God, divine in quality, the same as God. How can John define them as separate but the same? Well, John 1.14 later tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we know the Word is the pre-incarnate Christ, Jesus, the Word who was always there throughout the Old Testament. Even when people say there's no such thing as a trinity, 
as God is one, right? And you've heard this. You're familiar with the famous verse we read from Deuteronomy 6, 4, saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. One of the most quoted verses in the Old Testament, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But in the Hebrew, what is this word for one? It's the word echad. The Lord our God is one echad. And you know what this word means? It means one. It means another. It means one after another. It can mean one by one. It can mean in combination. And so how do we understand in the Hebrew that God is one but can be multiple? And this is going to make sense now. What do we read in Genesis 2.24? Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. They shall be echad. The word here is echad, the same word used for one. Two beings unified as one, but individual. And this is what we're seeing in John's prologue, that the word was in the beginning that the word was with God, and that the word was God. And this answers this issue from an apologetics point of view, John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. But if no one's seen God at any time, who have people seen? Who is it that people saw throughout the Old Testament? We hear these stories of the angel of the Lord, or the Lord showed up, and I lean towards the reality that these are Christophanies, that this is Jesus showing up in the Old Testament, because John right there, he says in 118, that Jesus is the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. So John has just defined for us that the Word is the only begotten God, and God is the Father. There's the Word, and there's God the Father. And so what John is saying is that no one has seen the Father. So who was it? Who was it that appeared to Abraham, to Moses, that wrestled with Jacob? Who was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace? Even in John 8, where Jesus says, before Abraham, I am. Do we understand this reference, how shocking it is? Well, to see it, we've got to understand what Genesis 18, 1 to 8 says. It's this picture that goes deeper, telling us how Abraham washed God's feet, how Abraham fed God a meal, sat with God beneath the trees, had a long face-to-face -face interaction with God, pleading for Sodom and Gomorrah. So not only did God appear, but he had some sort of physical body. I mean, John even quotes Jesus himself in a confrontation with the Pharisees that to me, seems to sound like Jesus is who was there with Abraham. Listen to what it says in John 8, 39. They answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Jesus is telling them that they were Abraham's children. They would be doing the works Abraham did. What works? What is Jesus referring to here? Because then Jesus goes on to say, this is not what Abraham did. This is not what Abraham did. When did Jesus see Abraham? Even the Jewish crowd are tripping at this statement. Jesus implying that Abraham didn't do what they are aiming to do which is kill him. And this makes it sound like Jesus is who Abraham interacted with. But how can this be? If John has said, verse 18, no one has ever seen God. Because in the context of chapter one, verse 18, John is saying that no one has ever seen God the Father in that sense. But who have they seen? They've seen the word who was with God, who was God, who is namely, the son jesus so rightly understood as we close out john's prologue john 1 18 no one has ever seen god the father but 
the one and only Son, there's the Word, there's Jesus, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, your translation might seem in the bosom, has made him known. So there we are. Jesus is the Word, the Son, and God divine. And so because John is writing now as an evidence for all of this, he's made his statement, his prologue. Go back and read John 1 to 18. You will see it. Here's the Word. Here's God, the pre-incarnate Christ. He's always been with God, and he is divine, the begotten Son in the bosom of the Father, who I believe appeared to many in the Old Testament. And this is the testimony John begins with. And so where does he take us today? Into the testimony of another person, namely John the Baptist, John 1.19. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And so John has been out here in the wilderness telling the nation to repent because the Messiah is soon arriving. And what do the leaders do? Well, the Jews, which doesn't just mean any Jew, it means the religious body at that time who were controlled by the high priests. They were coming out far outside of the city to ask of John, who are you? What are you doing? And I think this is a good thing. For us as a church in Orange County branches, if a new church was a few blocks away or the other side of town and there's certain messages or preaching coming out that you're hearing about, you're thinking, are they Christians? Are they believers? Do they line up with the word of God? Who are they? And so these men are coming out to ask of John, are you some prophet? Could this be Elijah? Maybe he's a heretic or a madman. But the text says they asked John clearly, who are you? And the first thing John wants them to know is, I am not the Christ. Because you've got to realize that by now, John has quite a resume. Born into the priestly line of Levi, under his parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, who were barren, too old to have children, and now have had this miracle child, John. John's father was visited by an angel and made mute up until John's birth. And let's not forget that God himself gave the name John. Verse 21 reads, And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. And the reason they asked this shows you just how serious they are. Because prior to this, 400 years prior, the prophet Malachi was speaking for God when he told Israel in Malachi 4.5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So if John really was this forerunner, the one who made the path straight as the forerunner, he must be Elijah. That's what Malachi said. That's what the prophecy is told the nation. Yet John responds by saying what? I am not. So again, as many challenge this in scripture as this supposed contradiction are we as believers missing something? Well, what did the angels say of John in Luke 1, 16 to 17? And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him, that's the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah. So is John the physical and literal Elijah? No, but in the same spirit and power, meaning office and ministry and evangelistic anointing of Elijah, yes. And I do believe that this is also a foreshadow that could Elijah possibly return to the earth before the dreadful day of the Lord. The verse does say before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which would be when the final timeline of human history closes. So probably next week for all we know, amen? Plus the Bible says it's appointed man to die once and then judgment. And to my knowledge, the only two people in scripture who have not yet died, Enoch and Elijah. So if you want to be specific, they both need to die before they are judged, amen? And I'm sure that gets your wheels turning. If you hold the view that the two end time prophets are physical, literal people, could it be Enoch and Elijah? Many think so. 
because they haven't died. And if people also accept that Jesus is Lord and Savior, then they have to accept that John has come in the spirit of Elijah. Jesus himself in Matthew eleven fourteen says, If you are willing to accept it, he, that's John, is the Elijah who was to come. And so the religious leaders go on. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. What they're doing is going down the list of prophecies about who this man could be. Because remember, these Jews who have come out to them have to give a word back to the religious leaders about who this rowdy troublemaker in the wilderness could be. And the reason they asked John if he is the prophet is because Moses, Moses who the nation of Israel has so much reverence for, made it clear that another prophet, one like himself, will be arriving, having said in Deuteronomy 18.15 that, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. The nation knows this prophet is coming. That's Old Testament. But even in the New, in Acts 3 and 18, we hear of how well they understood this, saying, For what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that is, Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Meaning this is all coming to fruition before their very eyes. Verse 22, Moses said, the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. Kind of amazing, right? In whatever he tells you. Moses has given you the law. We have the prophets. But whatever this man says, that is what goes. Especially when you realize that Jesus came to fulfill the law and tell us to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. The law hangs on these two commandments. But Moses goes on. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. It's amazing. And I don't even want to add to this, but just look at the authority given to this prophet, namely Jesus. Moses way back there in Deuteronomy knowing this day would come looking forward to this prophet Messiah Savior Jesus and so in John 1 they said to John who are you we need to give an answer to those who have sent us they ask again and as we noted earlier John could have said so much about his lineage so much about the prophecies but he didn't and here's what's crazy in terms of what we know of John, what do we even know? Jesus said in Matthew eleven eleven, Truly I say to you, among those born of women there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So what was it about John the Baptist? I mean, of what we can tell, was John this great leader when you compare him with Abraham or Moses, David or Joshua? Did John carry crazy influence like Joseph or Daniel? Did he win all these wars like so many of Israel's kings? Did he have all of this wisdom as we read about King Solomon? I mean, we don't even know if he was educated, what level of understanding this man had. And he wasn't known for his wealth, for his kingdom, for his legacy. In fact, all we know is that he lived like a homeless nomad out in the Judean wilderness. Yet Jesus said, 
there is arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. So what did John do? He just lived his call. He got his marching orders and partook of his ministry. And can I tell you, for all of us listening, myself included, there's nothing greater than for you or I to step into what God has called us to. I mean, we often think about the words we long to hear as we see the Lord face to face. Well done, good and faithful servant. And friend, that's exactly what we should be thinking. Simply focused on him, not laboring in vain or storing up treasures for ourselves here where there's rust and the moth can destroy. Because even though John the Baptist has this mighty call as the forerunner making the way anointed for that purpose, he doesn't have my call. He doesn't have your call. You're the one anointed to be you. I'm the one anointed to be me. Or John, as it was simply put in Luke 3, 2, that during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness, and he went. There it is. The word of God came to John, and he went, and he had childlike faith, and he fulfilled his course. Let us ask and challenge ourselves in 2023 as the world is upside down, and people are freaking out. What must we do? Hear the word of the Lord and go. Go. This childlike faith, go into all the world as John went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. Guys, it's simple and amazing and I hope you're getting stirred up. John 1, 2, 2. What do you say about yourself? Because they've asked John all these questions about Elijah and the prophet and so forth. So John, tell us then, who are you? If you're not the Christ, then think about it. Who doesn't like to talk about themselves? Who doesn't like to explain their situations, whether good or bad? John, this prophet of God, who I believe is the high priest of that day, rightfully so. What does he say in verse 23? Oh, you want to know who I am? I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Who am I? I'm a vessel. I'm a part of the body of Christ. I'm an eager servant, content and ready for each day's daily bread. John is actually replying to them with scripture. And this is a good place for us to realize. Consider where we are right now, 2023. We're living in a time where this whole celebrity preacher thing is blowing up in people's faces. Churches that are filled with people who look the part who were given platforms so early because they talked the right way, gave the right sound bites, had the right charisma, drive, or connection. Even just the other day, I was listening to a podcast where a couple of guys up in LA were discussing the whole Carl Lentz and Hillsong explosion. And they were saying it's really, sadly, partially, the people's fault. Yes, new believers are attending church or being brought there in this hype. But for real believers who should be solid, they're getting these messages sometimes that are about an inch deep. And it's all these sound bites and practical and motivational. And they're saying, look, we have the stage and the bells and the whistles and we're just like the world. And guys, there's nothing wrong with playing certain instruments, having a mega church, doing all of this. But the call is to make disciples, not just be celebrity preachers. The Bible says we're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Because when they asked John this, what did John say? I am the voice. You want to know who I am? I am the voice. And how practical and healthy would this be if we made that our ministry? We are just voices. We are pointing the way. We are shining the light towards Jesus, the very same one that John was making the way straight for. And church, for you and I to inspect our fruit, do a little bit of inventory, where are you in life? For the Lord, are you a voice? Are you shining the light to the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Or if we hold ourselves accountable, how many of us have gotten distracted 
How many of us have given birth to things that were not of the Lord or chased things not of God? Because if you gave birth to it, you have to feed it. But see, John, John knew his call. He heard God's voice. He was submitted to it. And a lot of you might have all kinds of chaos in your life because you're not just a voice. You're distracted. You're focused. You're caught up in all sorts of things. And it's true. John wasn't just a voice. He was the voice. The last Old Testament prophet we could say who's preaching this way from the old into the new. And in verse 25, they asked him, then why are you baptizing? If you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. Okay then, John, why all the commotion? Why are you proclaiming something or the being someone? And if you are not, then why is this going on? What authority do you have to baptize? And we just did baptisms this past week at the beach, Sunday. And the reality is if there was a crew next to us who were baptizing, I'd be asking the same question. Oh, what church do you attend? What do you guys believe? You're believers like us. I mean, you're performing these ceremonies. What are you doing? And they're asking John, by what authority are you doing these things? And in verse 26, John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. And notice John's disposition here, his reverence for Jesus. He says, among you stands one you do not know, meaning he is here. I'm the voice telling you even now, get ready because he is here humbly saying that John, who they're all coming to see, who's bringing in the crowds in droves, me, I am unworthy to untie his sandals. And see, in that day, It was the duty of a servant or translated slave, the doulos, to tie or untie his master's sandals, to be at his master's side, to be serving his master and what he needs. Yet John the Baptist, who Jesus says is the greatest in one sense, says, I am not even worthy to untie his sandals. And the amazing thing here, is that if we think of Jesus' ministry as he calls them and they follow, as he teaches them and directs them, as disciples showing them how to walk in love, preaching, teaching, miracles, signs, and wonders, what does he go on to say in John 15, 15 later on as they've walked with him? He says, no longer do I call you servants, slaves, the doulos. For the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Meaning not only did Jesus lead them, but he brought them in and gave them understanding, taught them God's plan, and entrusted them to continue with this message, even us today. God could have done this anyway forcing them, making them, attacking them, but instead he freely invited them as he invites us to partake of this plan. And even this idea of servant, a slave, the doulos, as I've said many times, it's not how we hear about it today in America. Back then, many people didn't have certain jobs. Certain positions, of course, didn't exist. And so they wanted to work for a family, work for a community. And so they would sign up to be a servant or a slave, whichever way you translate it. Because in that day, there was a wealthy owner and that servant or slave came to work for him generally. So did his wife and the kids and they all lived on that wealthy person's land. And the owner, the master, those who employed this slave or servant would take care of their wages and their bills and their medical and their family. And normally it was meant to be a really good relationship, but like life, you can have a bad slave owner. You can have a bad boss. You can have a bad spouse. So while people say, oh, the Bible is full of slavery and control. No, no, no. That is man doing something wrong. That's not God. In fact, the Bible is opposed to this idea. Yet in verse 28, we read, These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. And the next day, 
So the day after John was being challenged and questioned, and what's amazing about this day is that John dives deep, giving us all of these titles and names pertaining to Jesus. John gives us these ideas of Jesus as a rabbi, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the King of Israel. Even here he says, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we hear this and we say, crazy. What an amazing thing to say, but can I tell us, we honestly have no idea. Can we really imagine what it must have sounded like for John to be proclaiming this? A prophet, a religious leader, a voice out in the wilderness, in the spirit of Elijah, proclaiming, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Because this proclamation would have made the hairs on people's necks stand up. It would have caused people to stop and pay attention because the lamb was a sacrificial animal for the Jews. And it was slayed, killed, its blood was shed so that their sins might be forgiven. And so Jews were very familiar with this term, even as young children. But even as I said in the last episode, that the blood of the lambs did not put away sin. They simply pointed forward to the day when God himself would provide the sacrifice. When God himself would provide a lamb. A lamb that would finally take away the people's sin. And it wasn't that every person's sin would be forgiven in the Old Testament. Meaning everyone is forgiven because they sacrifice lambs. It's that Jesus' perfect sacrifice makes a way for all who offered those sacrifices, gave those sacrifices, proving they really believed, trusted, and repented to God, would be forgiven through Christ's sacrifice applied to their lives hundreds of years later. Again, Jesus is outside of time. And you may say, what do you mean? How come the lamb in the Old Testament didn't atone? Well, it wasn't really about the lamb, but more about the person's faith and obedience in this process, proving that they trusted God. And the fact that they were offering sacrifices proved that. But there's very clear pictures even in the Old Testament of what I mean. Even one of the Jews' great patriarchs with who? Abraham, the father of faith. Because when Abraham took his son Isaac up on the mountain, was it about the sacrifice or was it about his faith? As we heard a few weeks ago in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. So Abraham believed. It was faith, right? But that faith was active, meaning Abraham was ready to offer his son. He did completely trust God with possibly the most valuable thing in his life. As Abraham was later on in age, he didn't have a child. And in that day, if you didn't have sons and daughters, grandkids in the lineage, you were looked down upon. And so what does Abraham do? Well, Abraham in Genesis 22, 6 We're told, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Verse 10. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Here's Abraham showing he is willing to do whatever God asks. But verse 11 tells us, But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, here it is, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. 
And so who provided the sacrifice in that story in the Old Testament? God. So did God need Abraham's sacrifice? No. It was about his faith. It was his act of faith and Israel was raised on these ideas. Ideas of faith in trusting God in the storm, in the famine, practicing ritual after ritual and ceremony after ceremony. Even as we talked about with the Aaronic priesthood a few weeks back, with all of that, the rituals, the priesthood, the sacrifices, all of it is right now in John's day being fulfilled in Jesus as the Lamb of God and also as the eternal priest in the order of Melchizedek. And it's important for us to understand that Paul references this story of Abraham to show his faith. But James, James references it to show us that true faith will produce works. This is exactly why you famously heard the verse from James that says, Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. He's saying that real faith is lived out alive in you and me now. I heard someone preaching this week, and they said, How is it that we fly on a plane and we trust a pilot we don't know? Or we ride on a bus and we trust a driver we don't know? or even on a boat with a captain we've never met, yet we claim to know God, but find it hard to trust him. Wow. But in all of this, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel were trusting God with their sacrifices, looking forward to the day when God will provide that lamb. And not only this, but what John is saying is that this lamb of God, behold a lamb, if he's really the lamb, What did all the other lambs do? They died. They were slain. They were killed. We could preach on this all day. Even that John says, who takes away the sin of the world. That means he didn't just die for it, carry it, handle it, walk around with it. That means that when the Lamb of God died, took all our sins upon him, that he took them away. He does away with them. Our sins are gone away from you, away from me, away from all who would call on him. We're all declared innocent as God has chosen to forget our sins, overlooking them through Christ. And verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was born before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Now John would have known Jesus. Jesus was his cousin. They should have been acquainted in some sense, as most scholars suggest. Mothers were related. Surely they interacted in some sense in 30 or so years. But even though John was born a few months prior to Jesus, Jesus has always existed, is eternal. And so John is presenting him as Messiah, Savior, as he that is above is above all, holy and God. Verse 32, and John bore witness, we're continuing John's testimony, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, that's God speaking to John, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. How amazing that John is personally made aware by God that when he sees the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove resting on this man, he's the Messiah. And that he would be the one that baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And guys, I know we read this so casually so often, but I preach on this all the time. A lot of churches or youth groups or Bible studies and why? Because I believe we're lacking in the area of understanding one of the primary things that Jesus came to do, which was bring the Holy Spirit's presence to all believers, to fulfill the prophecies of God that one day his spirit would dwell in his sons and daughters. What do I mean? 
See, in the Old Testament, God's Spirit dwelt on people at certain times. They were anointed, called, set apart. But now since Christ, because of his death and resurrection, we have access to the Father. And when we confess Jesus as Lord, we receive the Holy Spirit, are full of the Spirit of God, are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and continually filled over and over as we see in the book of Acts. Meaning that the Holy Spirit is here with each and every one of us once we believe we're born into God's kingdom. And now we have that anointing, that empowerment by him. And verse 34 says, And I have seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. Another affirmation of what was said in John 1.18, that this is the Son of God, the Son divine. And so now we venture off into another day. A third day in John's testimony where we see John's own disciples humbly told by John to follow who? Jesus. Verse 35 reads, The next day John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, Where are you staying? Where are you staying, Jesus? Which means where do you dwell? What is your path? Where are you going? Because they have heard from John and believed his message as his disciples. But now, John has told them it's time to follow Jesus and become his disciples. Meaning Jesus will become the rabbi. And this would mean, if someone was a rabbi to his students, to his disciples, that they'd be with him daily. They'd spend the day with him, the night with him. They would mirror him. They'd learn what he says, learn what he does, go where he goes, proclaim like him, learning his teaching, which is known as his yoke. That's a teaching. That's what it would mean in that day. Even the famous saying, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. They would stay so close to the rabbi that even the dust as he walked would get on them. And in verse 39, he said to them, come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. So Jesus is down. I'll teach you. And they're having no education that we know of, which generally means that by the age of 13, if you were that bright, if you were that smart, if you'd have memorized so much of the Old Testament, what is written, then rabbis would have pointed you out, would have said, hey, follow me. That's what they would say, follow me, I'll be your rabbi. It's like getting a scholarship to somewhere, but we don't see that here. We just see Jesus calling them. And what's amazing about this verse that you may not have heard is that the author is pointing out this all happened at the 10th hour. Why is this significant? Because we've just heard how John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples. And what are we going to see? That one is Andrew. Who's the other? Who's the other and why would the 10th hour, meaning 10 a.m. by Roman time, be significant? Because scholars will say that one disciple was Andrew and the other is John, the author of the Gospel of John. And the fact that he doesn't mention his or this person's name, as John never mentions his own self, just saying the disciple whom Jesus loved, the fact that he knows the time is that he's giving us part of his testimony as he went from being John's disciple to being Jesus' disciple. And what did it take? It took the Lord saying, come and see. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And I know we mentioned the Holy Spirit just a minute ago. But what is the Spirit descending upon Jesus showing us? Well, this term Messiah or Christ, it means anointed one. That someone has been anointed for a reason. Even as we see people set apart and anointed for the calls, this anointed one, this Messiah, this Savior, Jesus, and he brought him to Jesus, that's Simon. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. 
And here's Jesus renaming Simon, Simon Barjona, the son of John. And he's been called this up until this point, but now Peter, which means rock. This given name by Jesus will be a picture from the outset of the kind of life Peter would live following after the Lord. And it's clear, guys, that he was a rock. Not just the foundation of the early church, but even in the way he even endured direct discipline from Jesus. Even being challenged from the Father on the Mount of Transfiguration. All the time, Peter was depending upon his flesh, trying to do things in his own strength, missing it until he was dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can't miss this point. How did the disciples lead people to Jesus in this sense? They heard of the Savior, the Messiah that people were familiar with, and they simply said, come and see. Come and see. Come and see who Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, the one that God has sent. And I say this because probably most of you don't feel comfortable sharing your faith. Don't feel comfortable having deep biblical conversations with family, even friends, even strangers that might challenge or even offend people. But notice in the gospel how natural and practical it was because they understood who this was. All these years of bondage and slavery being downtrodden. All these years of prophecies. Here is Jesus, the greatest of all. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. And what do they want to do? They have seen. And they want others to come and see. And for you and I, we can easily share our favorite music, our favorite movies, our favorite exercise, our favorite food. But what would it look like for us to just tell others, come and see? Because as you begin to share, well, wait, you go to church? Wait, you're a Christian? But what about this? What about that? You will begin to give a defense because you love Jesus, you care, and the Spirit of God is inside of you. And he will use your testimony. He will use whatever verses you may know and be intentional about knowing the word more, being familiar with the stories, being available to share the gospel. But for you and me, This is the call, not just to believe, but to now invite other people to come and see. And as you share, and they ask, what's the difference with Buddhism or Hinduism or atheism? Well, he died on a cross, a torture device. He shed his blood. He rose again. Do you see what he did? God will use all of that as you sow seeds, as you plant, as you water, as he gives the increase. And so we see in verse 43, This is now the next day where your translation might say, Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael. And we read that Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And notice just how aware people were of who was meant to come, who was spoken of in both the law and the prophets. And who were Philip and Nathaniel? Were they well-learned men? Were they rabbis? Were they theologians? No. It was just common knowledge that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had spoke about this coming day. Now, if you put that alongside our culture, whether back in England where I was born or here in America, Most people have no clue what the Bible says. What they've learned about the Bible is from maybe bad experiences they had as kids where they found one thing wrong with a pastor or a Christian and got offended. Or maybe through things other people have said. Maybe really terrible shows they've seen on the History Channel that are super biased. Or maybe YouTube videos. Let alone the supposed millions of gods, false religions and deceptions we see flooding our airwaves, media, phones and the rest. But verse 46, Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And this is because Nathanael was from Cana. Cana was in Galilee. And despite the fact that they were despised by the Judeans, hypocritically, those who came from Cana also had an issue with those from Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. And Philip said to him, Come and see. 
Verse 47 tells us, Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And of course we know that as far as sin is concerned, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But as far as someone's character, who is direct, blunt, seeking truth, Jesus is saying, this is Nathanael. Verse 48 Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And we can't just miss these moments, because they're here for a reason. Here's Philip testifying to who Jesus is. And then Jesus personally demonstrates who he is, willingly engaging and moving supernaturally. What do I mean? Well, let me ask us, by whom was Jesus anointed? The Spirit of God. And what power do we see Jesus operating and fulfilling his ministry? The Holy Spirit. Acts 1.1 is clear when it says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit. And so as Jesus is empowered by the Holy Spirit, we see him speaking just now with this utterance of knowledge. The ability to know something that is supernatural. Like the the woman at the well having five husbands, Jesus was aware of this. Or the things that the Pharisees were thinking, he was aware. But here we see Jesus demonstrating this something he knows about Nathaniel. And this is throughout the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12.4 tells us, There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Meaning it's the Holy Spirit at work in the miraculous. In fact, even the next part in verse 5, there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There's service, that's Jesus. There are varieties of activities, but the same God. There's the plan and structure, but that's God, who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to the other the utterance of knowledge, as we just saw with Nathaniel, according to the same Spirit. Verse 49, Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And Jesus is right, of course. You will see God himself at work in human form by the power of the Holy Spirit, shocking the world and reaching the lost, spiritually dead, outcast. But Jesus goes on in verse 51. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, You will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And they will, encountering angels, having angels testify at the tomb or the ascension of Jesus. But is this possibly also a reference to Genesis 18, 12, where Jacob dreamed and saw a ladder coming out of heaven with angels going up and down? But only in this case, it wouldn't be the ladder who's the mediator, It would be Jesus. Jesus is the mediator between man and God, between heaven and earth. That Jesus is the only one who bridges the gap as sacrifice, as savior, as high priest. And note the term Jesus used here, the son of man. He used this more often than any other reference when referring to himself, using it over 80 times. And this is a messianic term. It's based on these profound verses from Daniel 7, 13 to 14, speaking of these dreams and visions that Daniel had. And as we read this, just consider what is happening, what has taken place, a real event. Daniel 7, 9 reads, As I looked, thrones were placed and the Ancient of Days, that's God, took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. 
A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, meaning millions, uncountable numbers were worshipping him. The court sat in judgment. And the books were opened, meaning God is about to judge. Lives will be considered. The moment is here. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. And for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And just look at this. How easily those who oppose God are done away with, dismantled, destroyed like nothing. Verse 13. I saw in the night visions. So we've had Ancient of Days. And now we're going to the Son of Man, the term Jesus used. And behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. If you're looking for the purpose and goal of life, that's it. To serve God, to walk with him, that's your reason for existing. All things made by him, for him, through him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. What a picture. Clear as day. God the Father, God the Son, judgment, destruction, mankind for all eternity. And so where do we end on this? Well, this really isn't the end. This is just the beginning. We've just heard from John the testimony of both John and John the Baptist about Jesus. We've also heard from Philip and Nathaniel and others all testifying about who Jesus is. And this idea of the Son of Man used over 80 times referencing the Old Testament that Jesus would be before the Ancient of Days God the Father, God the Son, and that Jesus has all authority. That the books were opened and many are going to be judged guilty, but many innocent. Let me ask you, if your book was opened today, if you stood before the Ancient of Days, are you guilty without Christ? Or are you declared innocent because of the blood of the Lamb? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Have you repented? Have you trusted? Have you believed? Have you confessed your sins and received this eternal life through the grace and mercy of God? Thank you, Jesus. Maybe that's you and today you need to get right. John 1, 1 to 18, all about the word being God. Then we heard today about the Lamb of God. We heard about God in the flesh, the perfect sacrifice for you and for me. Maybe you've messed up your life. Life's been crazy. You've done all the wrong things. But if you were to die today, where do you go? Do you believe? Maybe that's not you and you're just encouraged and you say, wow, Brian's really preaching right now and encouraging people to repent. Well, amen. Maybe for you and me, we need to start inviting people to come and see to share our testimony, to testify, to point the way, to be a voice, not be distracted of some things. You see, the Old Testament is a story of God, of course, and man, but it's a story of idolatry. We're distracted by all these things. We're caught up in all these things. I'm going to have a few testimonies coming up the next few weeks, next few episodes, but between chapter one and chapter two, what if you were to take what we've heard today and say, Lord, I'm going to invite people to come and see. I'm going to pray for the Spirit of God to convict and save others as I step out like John the Baptist, willing to proclaim. God, I just thank you for your sons and daughters today, that those who need to hear, hear your voice, that you, Jesus, have said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me, that people would even repent while listening to a podcast and put their faith in you, in your blood, that you're alive today, they confess, trust, and believe. And for us, Lord, those who already believe, we would share you like the God that you are. We would proclaim you like the Lord and Savior of our lives that you are. We thank you, God, for the cross, the blood, that you're alive today, and that we can go in your name and proclaim by the power of the Holy Spirit. Guys, 
Thank you for tuning in. This is available on YouTube. More people listen on the podcast than YouTube, but hey, like, share, subscribe, get it out there. Thank you for those of you who pray for the ministry I'm doing. I've been traveling like crazy. I'm going to Europe real soon, possibly Japan, but thank you guys for praying, for partnering. I raise full-time support as well. I couldn't do any of what I do without the support of others who believe and trust. And but for now, what did the Apostle Paul say? First Corinthians 1.18, that the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. God bless you guys. Amen. Hit me up on briansumner.net for more. Mm-hmm.